Thanks. Go ahead and have a seat. I have been revved up about this day all week long because I knew what you were in for, and that was a treat. I was so excited for Ava and Parker to lead us in worship today. Didn't they do a fabulous job? We're just so thrilled uh, that they did such a thing, and the band, as always, brings it and delivers it, so we were just thrilled and revved up uh, about this day, but I'm even uh, as excited uh, to introduce to you today uh, the young man that's going to be uh, preaching and teaching you uh, from the scriptures. His name is Hunter, and he has been part of our community of faith for several years. And one of the joys that I get uh, at this stage of ministry is just the opportunity to, to spend some time with some of these uh, young women and men who feel called into the ministry and just uh, to just love on them and just watch them grow. And Blossom and Hunter has had this message planted in his heart uh, for quite some time now, and he's just been looking for the opportunity to share it, and he has uh, just prepared and I am thrilled. I, uh, just so you know, I brought my Bible, I got my outline, and I got my pen ready. And if you don't, you need to get it well, uh, get it ready, because uh, God's got a word for you today through Hunter. So would you welcome Hunter Wiltshire to the stage as he shares God's word. Good morning. My name is Hunter Wiltshire. like uh, Pastor Tim was saying, and uh, I'm a member here at Miami Valley Church. I also have the opportunity to serve in the high school boys ministry. Um, now, when Pastor Tim asked me uh, to teach in a series called Summer School, I'm not going to lie, I cringed a little bit. Um, in my line of work with the teens, uh, it's pretty unwise to ever bring up school and anything. Um, and honestly, when I think of school, I think of homework, and really when I think of homework, I think of not doing it. Um, really... <laughs> Mainly doing it when the teachers get it, picking it up in class the day it's due. Um, but I, met, I imagine you'd have to be like me and have your name at the end of the alphabet. Um, unfortunately, that uh, habit has stuck with me into adulthood. Um, maybe one or two of you, uh, of you are like me uh, and meaning to take uh, Pastor Tim and Pastor Judd's messages and apply it to our daily prayers and meditations. Um, to really dig into what God is revealing to us through, uh, through their messages and grow in that day to day. But we find ourselves on Sunday reminding ourselves to remind ourselves to do it this time. Now, if there's one thing I've heard said on this stage uh, during this teaching that I would like to take personally to my own heart, it is that find your one challenge. You see, the name of the game is action. And if I could just find a way to push myself out of the discomfort and into a meaningful and bold conversation with that one person that God is telling me to talk to, I mean, that could mean someone's eternity, couldn't it? I might be able to be a part miracle in someone's life. Food for thought, I guess, but moving on. Now, when thinking and praying about what God wanted me to teach on today, I kept coming across the phrase, broken miracles. Now, I thought that was a bit of a catchy phrase, so I went ahead and named the message after it today. Uh, so if you all can just pray for me to come up with some way to make it about miracles, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I do want to discuss miracles, and perhaps in a way you've never heard them before discussed. But before I do, I'd like you, uh, to ask you all to try, in your own opinion, to come up with what is the greatest miracle. The Word of God illustrates many miracles that Jesus performed on his earthly pilgrimage. For the sake of time and not getting too off track, I'd like to address two of them today as viewed by Mark. So if you could all do, do me the honor and turn your Bibles to, Matthew, uh, to Mark chapter 7, we'll start in verse 24. And from thence he rose and went into the border of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go your way. The devil has gone out of your daughter. And if you could just turn your Bibles one page over to Mark chapter 8. We'll start in verse 22. And he came to Bethsaida, and they bringing a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees, walking. 
After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. Now, after reading these two accounts, I honestly can't really decide which of these two would be the greater miracle. However, I would venture to guess that a few of you might consider the resurrection of the daughter of Jairus only a few chapters before to be a greater miracle than a man receiving his sight or a woman's daughter having a devil cast out. But I wonder if Jesus were here on the stage today, what he would answer to the question, what is the greatest miracle? I believe that his answer would be much the same to the question, what is the greatest sin? And that is that all sin is equal in weight. So I would submit to you today that all miracles are equal in weight. But I still wonder, is there a greatest miracle? I'll let you think on that for a moment for a little bit of clarification on what I believe the Bible considers to be a miracle. I'm sure most of you have heard Pastor Tim refer to one kind of sin being anything you leave undone that would have pleased God. With that in mind, I would like to say that a miracle in the Bible is anything that happens in this world that would be impossible without God's intervention. Now, before anyone considers me a philosopher, I actually got that from a book written by C.S. Lewis called Miracles. If anyone's interested in a deep dive into the word miracle and its application in reality, this is the book for you. But you may have to be like me and read it a couple times. But really think on the implications of that statement. A miracle is anything that happens in this world that would be impossible without God's intervention. I mean, that covers the flood to salvation and then some. And so I really want to rest on on that today, on what I believe is the most important miracle for me. And if you're saved and know Jesus as your personal Savior, your most important miracle, you. And so imagine the humility and faith required for the woman whose daughter had the demon removed by Jesus. You see, she basically said that she was a dog, licking up the scraps and hoping for some scrap of a miracle for her daughter. Desperation might have been the starting motive, but something divine had to have happened in order for her to understand her place before God himself on this earth. Nothing about how Jesus carried himself uh, spoke of his royal status. Nothing except divine intuition would tell a woman to be so humble and believe so much that Jesus could do for her daughter what she herself could not. Sure, there was a release for torment from her, for her daughter, but the true miracle was the power of this woman's belief, of her freedom. Now, I recently asked the boys in the high school ministry what they thought the word freedom meant. All of them came to the same agreement, which pretty much is that uh, freedom is being able to do what you want when you want to do it. Now, I think God's idea of freedom is altogether different than this. And I think the interaction between Jesus and this woman illustrates that. You see, in the book of Matthew chapter 15, This woman is named a Canaanite, and in Mark, she is called and recorded as being from Syrophoenicia. Now, Canaan serves as a regional marker, um, as the map above shows you, uh, uh, and Syrophoenicia locates her to be in the northwestern quadrant of the map. Now, the city of Tyre is also mentioned, which puts us in that southern part where you can see the red circle. I say all of this, and yet I believe that Matthew's distinction of this woman being a Canaanite isn't for the purpose of geological location. You see, in the Old Testament, the land of Canaan, or the land flowing with with milk and honey, was to be Israel's inheritance. Canaanites were viewed as enemies of Israel, as they were a barrier between the Jews and their inheritance, Gentiles, or heathens, serving other gods. You see, thousands of years of disagreements and wars raged between the Canaanites and the Jews. So why would a woman, who is the enemy, have the audacity to ask Jesus for help. And yet Jesus looks at her and says, O woman, great is your faith. Freedom isn't about being able to do what you want. No, true freedom is no longer uh, feeling the burdens of the past, especially for this woman. You see, she knew the tensions between the Jews and the Canaanites. But what ultimately brought about this miracle was that when she looked at Jesus, she saw him for who he really was. And she instantly knew her place before God, a servant, a dog licking up the scraps. And Jesus was like, you've got it. Your daughter is freed. Now, I'd like to take a moment to speak to the one or two of you today who doesn't know Jesus as their personal savior. You see, Jesus died for you and he loves you. He has more than scraps for you. In fact, he has a feast in your honor when you accept him in your heart. And so I hope you have had the opportunity to see what a life 
changed by Jesus really looks like at its best. To be honest, I hope to better show that in my own life to the people I most care about. But sometimes miracles are also about being at the right place at the right time. As we look at the account of the man receiving his sight, we find that Jesus and his disciples traveled to a town known as Bethsaida. A man, was blind, a man who was blind was brought in front of Jesus. The amazing thing is that even though this man, without help, could never have found his way, God had both a plan and a crossroads set out in front of him. I think it's easy to look at this account and compare it to the popularized faith healing events you may have seen on YouTube or TV. Though these types of events are oftentimes riddled with lies and tricks, I, I think some of you today might think that this is the type of miracle to pursue. The show and the lights, with all the people all around loudly praising and begging, it's all very confusing. I don't intend to undermine that practice entirely, as I really truly can't verify in every instance that these types of miracles are false. But it's all very confusing, and I don't really get the draw. Why would it be a miracle, uh, such a great miracle if there's no salvation or revival of the Spirit intertwined with that fanfare? Jesus even removes himself and the man from the crowd and leaves the town uh, to perform this miracle. And that's where it gets interesting to me. I still struggle a bit with why does Jesus decide to spit in this man's eyes. I mean, Jesus definitely had the power in the moment with but a thought to heal this man. And yet there's this grotesque interaction between them. Uh, the best I've been able to come up with is that this man is the reason why. You see, even though he was blind, he needed to see something in order to believe in God. There needed to be a tangible experience for him. I see myself in that same light when it came to me knowing God. I was uh, hard-hearted and selfish, lost in sadness at realizing that I had lost everything that I thought I was, and it honestly took a snap from God to wake me up. And that was the miracle that I needed, but there was still a very important ingredient in this account that, from my experience that may be lacking in this account. I had no other alternative than trusting that God was real. Now, if you'll read between the lines with me for a moment, I think the portion of scripture that speaks of this man being led to Jesus is indicative of his heart. You see, when you're blind, you must rely on others. And I think this man had to have had amazing humility in order to ask people in his life to bring him to Jesus. Even more so when he allowed Jesus himself to guide him. There had to be a belief that there was no other alternative for him than to believe that Jesus was the savior he claimed he was. Either that, or he was really weird to just trust some random dude he just met that he heard a couple stories about to take him out of town. And so, I wonder what you're, where you're at on that today. Is there no other alternative? Or maybe you can succeed where I failed and recognize your place before God without having to suffer. Now, I'd like to take a moment to tell a story about a modern-day miracle and watch a clip afterwards. You see, in 1990... Dwayne Miller was serving as the senior pastor at First Baptist Church in Brenham, Texas. In January, he contracted a flu virus that ultimately penetrated the myelin sheath of his vocal cords and damaged the nerve tissue beyond repair. The damage of the virus on his vocal cords was significant and permanently damaged the nerve tissue. Unsurprisingly, Miller sought out the best medical uh, advice in hopes of healing. As one would expect, a pastor's voice is an absolute essential to his line of work. Thus, over the following three years, he was seen by over 63 specialists and their teams, totaling over 200 doctors as they tried to diagnose and treat him. He would later say that I had been left with a voice that sounded like the worst case of laryngitis you have ever heard and could only make that if I screamed at the top of my lungs. However, given his inability to speak clearly, he resigned from his post in 1991 saying, everything I have ever done to earn a living had been connected to my ability to speak, and suddenly my toolkit was gone. In April of 1992, Miller was asked to teach at his then local church for Sunday school. At first he refused, but after some prodding, he agreed to try. This recording is that day's message. So when the psalmist writes, and he heals all of my diseases, let me say to you that I believe God still heals. That hasn't ended. That is not over. Now you have to be careful on how you do this. Because there are folks who carry things to an excess and it becomes a show. 
And God has never intended that that be what it is. God heals in his sovereign will. I don't know why God does things that he does, but I know that he does. And the only thing he requires of me is to allow him to be God and me to be me and let it be. To say that every single person will always be healed because Jesus died on the cross is a misinterpretation of scripture. Not true. Won't work. Isaiah 53 doesn't talk about physical healing. I'm sorry. That's just not the context. And to impress that there causes a misinterpretation of scripture. That's wrong. On the other hand, to say that, since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again, is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in a box both ways. And he doesn't want to be in the box. So, the psalmist says, I'm excited, bless the Lord, O my soul. One of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And then in verse 4 he says, and he redeems my life from the pit. Now, I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had, and you have had in times past, pit experiences. We've both had, we've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we find ourselves in. And I don't understand this right now. I'm but overwhelmed at the moment I'm not quite sure what to say or do Honestly, when I first heard that uh, video, I cried like a baby in my work truck. Um, it's not the first time I've embarrassed myself in a car. Uh, there was this one time uh, I was just me and God in the car singing my, my heart out. I don't even remember what song was playing on Caleb. But I do remember that as the song ended, I stopped at a stoplight, realized my window was down, looked to my left, and saw some uh, teenagers videotaping me. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I imagine if you look long enough, you might find a video somewhere uh, that has me in it. My intention with this clip isn't to instill an expectation of a healing miracle in your life, unless, of course, that is what God should will. No, in the moments that this message was revealed to me, my biggest concern was not to leave an impression of expectation. What I mean by that is that in my experience, I've heard sermons about miracles oftentimes push a message about Increasing expectation or decreasing expectation? Uh, increasing the expectation of some grand spectacular miracle in your life, of God's divine healing. And if you haven't seen it, well, maybe you don't believe hard enough. On the other hand, there's messages that are set to diminish that expectation. That talk about the fact that in the larger scheme of time, miracles of a spectacular nature are pretty rare. I intend for this message to offer insight into what a miracle is, but without creating expectations. Now that isn't to say that you shouldn't expect miracles in your life, but rather that the, uh, that the little, almost imperceptible miracles God orchestrates on the day-to-day -day and moment-to-moment -moment are by far the most important for us to remember. A friend of mine really elevated uh, this thought to me when he spoke of a time that he had worked alone in a machine shop for over a year. You see, uh, the thing that he elevated most to me was uh, the countless amount of times that God had saved him from messing up a product and ruining a job. At that time, I thought it was crazy for me to consider just such an informal interaction uh, with God that focused around the job I perform every day. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought about the Matthew chapter 16, verse 7, where Jesus tells Peter that flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
And so I wonder what things God wants to reveal to us in the lonely and informal interactions we have with him. I'd like to think that if we're saved, we want to make our relationship with God better. And maybe that means tossing the expectations of the spectacular and embracing the mundane, day to day, habits and common practices that we engage in. Inviting God into those moments and allowing him to penetrate our comfortable. In my case, the places where I go in autopilot. From my perspective, that breaks the common understanding of miracles. But it really elevates that thing in us that God can really use to grow his kingdom. Now, I like to listen to podcasts, and uh, my favorite host in my favorite podcast like to talk about this idea of type 2 fun. Uh, Now, obviously, I can't talk about type 2 fun if I don't explain what type 1 fun is, which type 1 fun is fun that's more or less fun in the moment. Uh, For example, like riding a roller coaster. Uh, Heck of a lot of fun, great adrenaline rush, blood pumping, whole shebang. But nobody 20 years from now is telling their grandkids over a fire about the 19th time they rode the beast. Type 2 fun is fun that's not really a whole lot of fun in the moment, but it's a heck of a lot of fun to tell a story afterwards about it. Like maybe bringing your wife onto your father-in-law's property uh, for a couple hours when it's over 100 degrees. Sure, it's not a whole lot of fun um, in the moment, but afterwards, uh, several months afterwards, maybe in front of a church, it's fun to tell the story. (laughs) Pray for my wife, please. (laughs) Now, in the same way, I think there's type 1 and type 2 miracles. Type 1 miracle would be a miracle of a spectacular nature. The healing of a man's vocal cords. Live on stage, for that man and the people, it's a moving experience. But that feeling alone isn't enough to open someone's heart to Jesus. Type 2 miracles, however, would focus on the soul, the inside of a man or a woman. This is a change in the way that that person is made up. And it is, like it said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that person is a new creation. You see, Jesus was able to capitalize on both of these types of miracles simultaneously for maximum results because he could read the heart of man and knew both what was needed and how much power it would take to happen. And so what is the saying? Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. Now, I don't think God believes in luck, but I hope you get the point. You see, sometimes there is a need for both types of miracles, but I think it's easy to think that type one miracles are better than type two. That seeing a loved one healed of their immediate pain would be more than seeing them new at the foot of the cross. You see, there is power in rejecting the world and embracing the spirit, more so than any bodily healing ever could be. And that is because in one, it's a moment and temporary. On the other, it's eternal. And that is what I want to elevate you with today's message. No expectations, but a conviction to be more than you are today. To me, the most powerful part of Dwayne's message is that despite having ample opportunity to give in to the temptation of pity, I can tell by this man's very words that he trusted God in the midst of his pit. You see, that kind of faith cannot be created without God's intervention. No one will be able to convince me that a created being like us, born in sin, is capable of such blind resolve and faith without God's intervention. He is all around us, church, and he can be in you if you accept him. In my own life, there is a circumstance that I would consider to be the greatest miracle that I've ever been a part of. Unfortunately, this is the story of my father's passing. In 2013, my dad was diagnosed with stage four bladder cancer. Now, I'm not super well versed in medical terminology, but essentially, stage four bladder cancer is terminal. Um, Initially, he was given six to eight months to live, and, uh, but he had fight in him and he wanted to see what he could do. And so uh, he started the radiation and eventually needed a surgery that would remove the bladder and a neobladder would, be re- would replace it. Um, immediately after the surgery though, we weren't through the worst of it. Um, the surgery was pretty risky, but it still had a pretty decent survival rate. Um, the thing was, is that because it was stage four, it had entered his blood system. And so they needed to check and see if it had spread anywhere else. And so uh, they ended up taking, I believe, 13 lymph nodes out of his body and testing them. What ended up coming back was that all 13 lymph nodes had cancer in them. And so 
As soon as that happened, he, the doctor called him in and he went in for x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, the whole shebang, figure out what was going on. And no cancer. And so my dad, who was given six to eight months to live, was then given a cancer-free diagnosis. However, at the time, I thought that was the greatest miracle that I had ever seen. Because there are countless amounts of lymph nodes, I don't know how many, but just to pick 13 and then no larger masses in your body is a crazy thing to think about. But because it is stage four, it did enter the blood system, so chances are it's going to return. Unfortunately, it did return in 2016. Unfortunately, my dad did not leave this world well. You see, addiction and pain ended up dictating a lot of the decisions he made for the remaining three years after. And because of what he put in his body and the returning cancer, the doctors really couldn't do much for him. Um, what ended up happening was that he had an issue with clotting. And um, over the course of about two to three weeks, my dad had over eight strokes. And so it was like one day you could have a full-blown conversation with him, and the next he couldn't eat for himself. But there was a moment uh, before it got bad, right after the first stroke, where he could still communicate a little bit, um, that I had the opportunity to be with him alone in the hospital for an evening. Um, now, you don't really know what to say to people when they're going through something like that, so... We ended up spending most of the night just watching TV, not really saying much, just enjoying each other's company. And as the night wore on, my dad uh, just grew tired and he wanted uh, to go to bed, so he shut off the TV. And so we sat alone uh, and silent for just a minute with the lights on and everything. And as that was happening, I felt something move and stir in me, I guess, very deep seated. And it felt like the more that I tried to push it down, the stronger it started rising to the surface. Um, now, I've always been fairly honest with my family about my faith, but to be honest, I've allowed fear and rejection and uh, anger and pride to just keep me from truly being honest in the moment about what I believe and why I believe it, and especially with my dad. Um, he was a part of church for uh, a few years. He had done the small group thing and everything, and um, but for a long while before that point, he had never gone to church and wasn't really living a lifestyle that I would like to believe someone who believes in Jesus would do and live. And so this feeling that I was feeling that was rising to the surface that I couldn't really fight, that just kept building momentum, I, I quickly realized was this need. Uh, I, I needed to know that he knew where he was going at the end of the day. I I was terrified, to be honest. I was terrified that if, if both of us died tomorrow, that I wouldn't see him in heaven. And so I, I looked him in the eye, and honestly, with tears streaming down my, my face, I, I said, I love you, but I'm terrified. I, I'm terrified that if, if this ends here, we won't see each other again. And I just need to know that you know where you're going. And so all of that anger and that pride and that resistance, that anxiety that I'd felt for so many years, and I'm sure many of you have felt towards people in your own life, uh, started rising to the surface, but then instantly I saw all of that just disappear in my dad's eyes. And it was replaced by just tenderness and comfort. And he just spent a moment talking about uh, his long-standing faith in Jesus and that life had been hard. Things had beaten him up. Unexpected consequences and turns had, had brought about things that he wasn't intending for his life. And it had caused some strain, but at the end of the day, he knew and remembered the Lord that had saved his soul. And that he knew without a doubt where he was going. And so we spent the rest of the night uh, just kind of crying, praying, having a good time. Um, but it ended that way. Unfortunately, about two weeks after that, my dad passed. See, miracles, they don't always mean healing in this life. Sometimes they mean healing in the next. Now, I know I'll be with my, God and my dad again one day in better circumstances. 
And maybe you need to just tell that one person in your life that God was, is really telling you to talk to, that you love them and that you just want to see them in heaven and mean it. If you haven't accepted Jesus, I want to tell you that I may not know you, but I want to get to know you in heaven. We'll have plenty of time there. And so will you but humble yourself and ask Jesus to forgive you and come into your heart? And so for those of you who do know Jesus as their personal Savior, I have but one question for you today. Are you the greatest miracle that God has given to you? Do you believe it? See, when I thought on this point, I kept coming back to the faith of a mustard seed. Belief is a powerful thing. It moves mountains and commands the seas of the heart. And so I ask this question because I believe everyone has a decision to make today. I also believe that at least I can do better at simplifying the message of the gospel to the people in my life. To be honest, it can be hard sometimes, though. For me, I so desperately want to convince that person in the moment to just bend their knee and recognize, and b- b- recognize themselves before God and accept his free gift. My final point today is broken and yet blessed. What a wonderful contradiction. I felt the name Broken Miracles was fitting for this message because sometimes it seems that all we can do as humans is break things. Friendships, marriages, job opportunities. Your mom's very expensive and one-of-a-kind handmade vase that she'll never let you live down. But in my opinion, one of God's very best qualities is his ability to take something broken and make it whole again. Even make it better than it was before. And so broken and yet blessed seems like a contradiction. Because who would think that a broken vessel could be anything other than useless? But it seems like a very unique thing that when it comes to God's people, we are at our very best when we are at our most broken. It took me far too long to be able to be honest with my dad about my faith. I can only imagine what our relationship could have been like had I been more intentional about, uh, more intentional about making our interactions about God. And so I wonder if any of you have people in your life that you could just say that I love you and I want to see you in heaven and really mean it. I know I do. And so I think back to the faith of a mustard seed. Such a small act of true and loving honesty can move mountains. And I hope we can be more honest and see God move in the lives of our loved ones. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for this message as it's ripped up my heart for the better part of three years and just thinking about how I'd want it to be communicated and ultimately how you wanted it to be communicated. I pray that it hits home uh, to the lives of the people um, that need it today, Lord. And for those who don't know you, Lord, may you just strike their heart. May you just push them to drive themselves at the foot of your cross and recognize you as God and be humble and know their place, but also accept knowing that you have more than scraps for them. I thank you for this opportunity, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.